Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Call to Action, Planning for Next Steps. Uh, this is the fourth and final webinar in the series Addressing Equity in Pedestrian Infrastructure in Charlottesville and Albemarle County. My name is Ian Thomas with America Walks, uh, and I'd like to thank uh, a number of colleagues and partners. Uh, first of all, Timothy Bodie with AARP Virginia, who, who brought America Walks in to uh, facilitate these webinars. Sue Friedman and Chris Miller with the Charlottesville Area Alliance, who have coordinated the growing partnership in Charlottesville and Albemarle County around the issue of pedestrian safety and accessibility and equity. Um, and then my colleagues, uh, Garrett Brumfield, who has co-facilitated the workshops, uh, and Rachel Kartner, who has helped on the back end. So as a reminder, the goals for these webinars are that advocates for equity, inclusion, and mobility justice will access tools and resources to build political will for change, a strong and diverse coalition of both community organizations and government agencies will implement an ambitious and achievable action plan. State and local transportation agencies will incorporate accessibility and walkability audits into their planning and design processes. And accessibility standards will be adopted to improve condition for people with disabilities and everyone else. And here's the... Uh, series of webinars. Uh, we have already completed the first three, um, and those were all recorded as this one is being, um, and those links have been sent out and will be sent out again so that if you missed any, you can go back and watch those. I'm going to give a quick recap on what we have covered um, in that, uh, it, it, oh, first of all, um, about 80 of you have registered for this webinar series. Um, you represent community advocates for a variety of causes and uh, government staff working in planning and transportation and public health, um, as well as uh, a number of uh, individual uh, local leaders, uh, in particular neighborhoods of Charlottesville and Albemarle County. And um, as you registered, uh, you answered a question about why equity and walkability is important to you. And this word cloud represents the keywords that came out of that question. And so I think this kind of sums up what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, so in the first webinar three weeks ago, uh, we reflected on the in-person workshop that took place uh, out there at the uh, edge uh, on the edge of uh, Charlottesville by the intersection of Highway 29 and Hydraulic Road, uh, and the uh, walk audit and wheels in motion audit that we did on on that day, and some of the learnings from that about how difficult it is to get around this particular part of uh, Charlottesville. Um, we then moved on to um, learn more about the Americans with Disabilities Act and how um, that uh, federal law is supposed to improve um, accessibility and um, uh, ensure there's no discrimination in uh, the way the public space is designed. Um, we also heard in particular from Paul Rudisil uh, with the city of Charlottesville ADA office that the uh, city's ADA transition plan is currently reaching the end of an, a really important update and revision process. And Paul is very open to hearing from uh, advocates and residents um, within the community uh, and helping make sure that that is a, a strong and actionable plan that will really make improvements. Um, in the third um, webinar, uh, just a week ago, we focused on equity, which is the importance of investing in the communities where there is the greatest need. And we looked in particular at pedestrian fatality data showing that uh, 
people with lower incomes are at much higher risk from being killed while walking than people with higher incomes. And also that people with black or African American uh, racial ethnic backgrounds or American Indian Alaska natives are at significantly higher risk um, because of the way our communities have des been designed, because of all the systemic forces that uh, make life much more difficult, make mobility much more difficult uh, for people of those racial ethnic backgrounds. And we focused in particular on uh, the Rondo neighborhood of St. Paul as an example of something that happened all across the United States in the 1950s and 60s of an African-American neighborhood being intentionally uh, damaged, virtually destroyed by routing an interstate highway right through down the main street of that neighborhood. So coming now to our final webinar, we will all be engaging in a significant amount of action planning during this uh, webinar. Um, there'll be uh, three separate uh, breakout sessions when uh, um, you will go into smaller rooms with a facilitator to discuss uh, key questions around the vision for this action plan, some specific goals that you want to make sure are included in the action plan, and then picking one of those goals, um, what strategic action steps uh, do you feel should be taken in order to accomplish or move towards that goal? Um, but before that, uh, we're going to have a number of um, inspiring presentations from guests from around the country um, who have uh, got, got some um, really uh, useful, relevant resources, uh, stories, uh, and tools to share. Um, not suggesting that any one of these or all of them should be, you know, incorporated absolutely into the action plan, but these will hopefully sort of trigger some really creative uh, thinking around this action plan. And these are all uh, uh, tools and resources, things that could be followed if you feel it aligns uh, with um, the vision and goals that you uh, that, that you want for Charlottesville and Albemarle County. So I'll briefly introduce uh, folks now um, and, and then um, come back uh, when we start these uh, brief presentations. So Maria, Wardaku with Alta Planning will talk about the Inclusive Walk Audit Facilitators Toolkit. Uh, Daniel Littlefield from the city of Milwaukee uh, will talk about their community-led traffic calming program and lending library, which is a really cool way to do quick build projects in the neighborhoods to test out ways to create streets that are more for people than for cars. Jill Lokentor, uh, from Denver will describe the campaign that she led for many, many years to um, shift the uh, funding responsibility for sidewalks from private property owners to the city. And that is the fact that most cities, and I'm quite certain Charlottesville is included in this, um, require by law that the sidewalks are maintained by uh, private property owners um, and then the private property owners, you know, don't even aren't even aware of it typically. And so it doesn't happen. And there's no enforcement of those local requirements because um, because the city feels it looks punitive to, you know, bill uh, individual property owners for repairing their sidewalks. And it's just, a, a you know, a, a poorly designed system. So then has bucked that system and has come up with a much better system. Jill will talk, talk about that. And then um, culminating our uh, short stories today, Axel Santana with PolicyLink and the Transportation Equity Caucus will give a high level uh, overview of key principles and values in how to organize for transportation equity, how to ensure that everything that this action plan uh, lays out prioritizes the people and the communities and the places that have the greatest need. So before we jump into the first presentation, we do have a live poll. 
And uh, Rachel, if you want to pull up that live poll, um, these are this is the question. How engaged will you be in developing and implementing the Charlottesville and Albemarle County accessibility and walkability action plan? And I will now stop sharing my screen so that uh, you can all see the poll. So R Rachel, OK, yeah, looks like the poll is up. <laughs> and people are responding and um it's uh it's good to see that a couple of people have already said they're going to be highly engaged and happy to lead a committee i realize we have one or two people that are our guests from outside the area and um, won't really be in a position to be part of this um and uh several people interested in the project but have limited time and capacity so this is helpful for designing this this process and uh and several people i will commit as much time as possible this is an important project great uh is that about was there's a few people haven't participated i'm guessing that's myself and some of some of the rest of us here so uh we'll go ahead and close the poll thank you very much for that and Share the results. There they are. Um, and at this point, I'd love to uh, introduce Maria Wardaku uh, with Alta Planning. Tell us about the uh, Inclusive Walk Audit Facilitators Toolkit. Go, go ahead, Maria. Great. Thank you. Share my screen. All right, should be seeing my screen now. We are. Great. Okay. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I, uh, I'm Maria Wardoko. I'm a planning associate with Alta, um, as Ian said. And my computer is working a little bit slow today, um, but Alta is a um, planning and design firm with a vision to mitigate climate change and advance safety and social justice through sustainable mobility. Um, and we, um, we do that by connecting people to places. We have planners, engineers, designers, uh, we do education and encouragement programs and community engagement, and we have more than 200 staff across the United States. Your slide's not advancing, Maria. Oh, that's good. There we go. Thank you. Should be working now. Nope. Oh. Let me try and ending it, sharing it again. While Maria is doing that, I will just say we're not going to have time in the agenda for a Q&A session, uh, but I encourage you uh, to type your questions into the chat and I ask the speakers to look in the chat and respond to questions that are directed to you or that you have um, feedback on. All right. Hmm. Is it showing up again for you? Yeah, we have the first year cover slide. Okay. Then now that we're advancing. Yep. There you go. All right. So sorry about that. Okay, so um, Ian reached out to the Minnesota Department of Health because he ran across the Inclusive Walk Audit Facilitator's Guide, um, and he wanted uh, to hear a little bit more about it. My colleagues and I at Alta worked together with the Minnesota Department of Health, um, including Ellen Pillsbury, who's on this call, 
along with consultant Chensma Walker and a work group of people with a broad range of disabilities to create this guide. It really came out of a desire to make transportation planning more inclusive of people with disabilities because we know people with disabilities are really the most impacted by poor transportation systems. They're the most sensitive to street design. And uh, we decided to look at one specific tool that we use frequently in transportation planning processes, which is the walk audit. So I know you all are familiar with walk audits, so won't linger on this too long, but we do walk audits to bring together diverse groups of people to share an experience and motivate them to action to improve safety and comfort for people walking. Before I get too deep into sharing here, I just wanted to define two key terms I'm gonna use. Um, one is walking. So walking I use as a term to include all forms of mobility devices. So whether you use a wheelchair, a cane, a walker, another mobility device, anything that allows you to travel at human speed, uh, that's included in walking. And then the other term is disability, and I'm using that term to mean a physical or a mental condition that may limit or alter major life activities for a person, whether that's temporary or permanent. Um, so we wanted to develop a way of doing walk audits that was as broadly inclusive of people with disabilities as possible. So we convened a work group of people who um, have mobility impairment, hearing loss, low vision, traumatic brain injuries, and autism. And we brought them together um, to experience a walk audit. We facilitated that walk audit as we normally do. And then we asked for their input. I was pretty overwhelmed by the response to our first walk audit. You know, we tried to make it as accessible as possible. Um, we tried to do a really good job, but the people in our work group were really stressed out and confused um, and the tensions ran really high. So we took their suggestions for improvements and we developed some initial guidance. Then we invited them on a second field walk where we implemented that new guidance and the results were wildly different. The work group members were much more comfortable. They were much more able to fully participate. Um, we again then took their suggestions for improvement and we developed the facilitator guide. Um, there, for me, there were really a lot of unexpected findings. Um, I learned that there is so much more to um, accessible transportation planning meetings and walk audits than making sure that we have meeting space that's physically accessible to those who are using mobility devices. What I was most surprised by is how important communication is uh, for making an accessible space. And uh, without going into all of it, um, I encourage you to check out the guide to learn more exactly about how communication supports accessibility. Um, the other thing that we learned from the work group was um, that directly inviting people with disabilities to your walk audit is the best way to make, to put disability at the center of that experience. Um, people with disabilities can speak from their own experiences. They can highlight issues that they experience in other weather conditions or at other times of day. Um, so that's really the number one priority. We also asked our work group whether mobility stimulation devices are a tool that we should be using on walk audits. We were concerned that using them could be perceived as disrespectful. Um, but ultimately the consensus among our work group was that providing devices like low vision goggles or wheel wheelchairs um, and also training participants on how to use them safely and respectfully was um, a good way to help participants without disabilities expand their understanding of um, how a street is functioning. And work group members even were interested in trying simulation devices to expand their own perspectives. So, for example, a person who has hearing loss uh, wanted to try using a wheelchair on our walk audit. Um, so thinking about what's happened since, we have um, presented our guide to audiences in Minnesota and nationally. We have applied the findings to our own walk audits, 
And we're actually now um, training MnDOT designers, planners, and project managers um, using this facilitator's guide. So just last week, actually, we hosted the first of nine multi-day trainings on designing for pedestrians and bicyclists the MnDOT way. We spent a portion of the training on a session that we called Connecting Design Guidance to Human Experience. Um, in that session, we talked through all the features of the pedestrian environment, the buffer, the pedestrian access route, the frontage, um, and we talked about MnDOT's guidance on their widths, their slopes, and other characteristics. And I don't remember if I said this, but MnDOT, Minnesota Department of Transportation. Um, so we then took the participants outside to experience the real world using a variety of simulation devices. We trained them on how to use wheelchairs, low vision goggles, strollers, um, and a short stature periscope safely and respectfully. Um, and we really emphasize the simula simulation devices are not meant to um, fully uh, mimic the experience of people with disabilities. They're just kind of providing a window into that experience. So we gave them these simulation devices. We had them then walk along um, a sidewalk that doesn't meet guidance and one that does, and we have them compare those experiences. Um, at the end, they said that they loved the field walk. They loved getting to use those devices. Um, my personal experience as a transportation planner is that riding in a wheelchair once teaches you the importance of a level, unobstructed, wide walkway more than reading about it ever could. You feel the importance of good design for people walking at just a much, much deeper level after using the simulation devices. And that feeling makes a huge difference when you're back in your office viewing those street designs from a thousand foot view or deciding how to allocate funds. Um, so I don't know if this will play, but um, here are our participants on the walk audit using wheelchairs, um, measuring the slopes of um, the sidewalk, uh, guiding each other with low vision goggles. We have strollers. Um, and then uh, you might see it here at the end. Yeah, this is somebody using this short stature periscope, which we built. Um, using a template from the Global Designing Cities Initiative that I'm happy to share. Um, and that is my time for today. Thank you, Maria. Um, thank you for having me. Please feel free to reach yeah, out well, anytime. Th thanks so much for sharing. And I think that's a really um, an important additional um, lived experience um, strategy that, that you've you used in creating that toolkit um many of us have done walk audits for many years and we've always looked at the built environment and for how it supports um mobility for people with disabilities and we've invited people with disabilities to come along and participate with us and we watch their experience and um, ask them to share their experience and sometimes we do you know what what you said there where somebody who doesn't normally travel in a wheelchair will do so to get the experience but what you've focused on here and what um the group in charlottesville and albemarle county should think about is you've made those walk audits really inclusive for people with disabilities to come along and be a full part of it and uh, that's that's such an important thing thank you so much um uh, I think I mentioned this, but if you have questions for Maria or any of the other speakers, please put them into the chat and they will respond. Next, I'm going to go over to uh, Danya Littlefield with the city of Milwaukee. Um, tell us about your community-led traffic calming program. Thank you so much, Ian. Um, let me hopefully uh, successfully share this. <laughs> worried now. Um, yeah, so um, thank you, Ian. Um, my name is Danya Littlefield. Um, I'm a senior transportation planner with the city of Milwaukee. And um, yeah, here to talk about our community-led traffic calming program and also the lending library and how, that, how those two uh, programs work together. 
Um, our big goals for this should look uh, pretty familiar uh, to you all, but our, our big goals with the program are to make our streets safer for all ages, modes, and abilities. And really the uh, last bullet point here is key for this program um, to kind of expand our community members and our residents um, sense of ownership over their streets and to incorporate resident led design um, into our street safety measures. Um, as many of you I'm sure know, um, the people who live uh, on our streets and look at them, interact with them, walk across them every day, often have um, really the best ideas about what would be impactful in their, in their space. The history of this particular program. Um, so the city of Milwaukee had for a long time a neighborhood traffic management program. Um, we have a lot of acronyms for these uh, programs. So that was called the NTMP. It really over time turned into a speed hump request program. Um, and uh, in early 2023, the city and some uh, residents that knew that there were other things that could be done for traffic calming to create a safer walking environment in our neighborhoods. Um, sort of looked at each other and like, wait, how how did this program evolve to be just a, a speed hump request program? Um, so uh, the Department of Public Works, along with our partners, rethought the program and um, essentially expanded the types of traffic calming measures that could be requested um, through uh, and, and rebranded it as the community-led traffic calming program. And what that means is that, um, as I mentioned, a variety of um, measures can be requested. They're then evaluated and designed by the city um, and then installed. Um, one, uh, in this kind of uh, is related to kind of something you mentioned earlier, Ian, but property owners in Milwaukee are assessed a portion of the cost of the construction of traffic calming improvements. Um, that's the way our funding works right now. But because of that, that was, you know, all the more reason to give residents more of a voice in what those traffic calming measures would be. Um, part of it is being paid for um, through tax assessment. Um, and as part of a revamp of the program, a new guidebook was created to really uh, do education uh, or um, outline what all of the potential measures that could be installed are, what the estimated cost would be, and what the impact, you know, what type of streets were, are they um, most effective on and in what kind of circumstances would they be used. So here's a little bit of a picture of what that guidebook looks like. There's kind of terminology um, for those traffic calming measures um, outlined. And then for each of them, a description, a photo, um, a diagram of who uh, who's assessed and kind of how much it would cost. Um, and then a program um, step-by-step trying to really break it down so that anyone could pick up this guidebook and engage in um, traffic calming in their neighborhoods. Um, one key thing you can kind of see in a in step two here um, that we wanted to make sure is that people who weren't, I mean, to be frank, we don't have a ton of chicanes in uh, the city of Milwaukee, even though they're available through this program. Um, and some, depending on where you live in Milwaukee, you may never have seen a pedestrian refuge island that might help you cross the street. So one of the things we wanted to do was make sure there were ways for people to learn about all of these different measures that are parts of the program in a more kind of tangible way um, and engage with their neighbors about it. So if uh, residents aren't sure what will work best, um, one option that is available to them through this kind of um, reimagined program is the Traffic Calming Lem Lending Library. And what that means is that um, if residents don't know what uh, traffic calming measures might work well on their street already, they can take a quiz, um, an online quiz to help them narrow it down, or even just reach out directly to the department and we can talk about options. Um, then they can kind of request uh, a traffic calming lending library demonstration from city staff. And um, one uh, great thing I wanted to mention is that the original uh, materials that you see here that make up the Traffic Calm Lending Library um, were supported through a Connecting Communities grant through AARP. Um, so we're really happy to have that partnership here in the city. Um, and essentially, um, with these uh, materials here, 
um, and sort of a recipe book um, that we developed. Um, we there are you know several not quite every you know a speed hump doesn't quite fit in here or a speed table, but many of the potential traffic calming measures can be approximated with these very temporary materials and allow residents to engage in a more direct way in what that would feel like on their streets. Um, when we deploy this, um, you know, here's a little example of what this might look like. Um, you can see a kind of mini uh, traffic circle being built in the center of this intersection that is quite wide, but has, um, this is near to the University um, of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. There's a lot of um, older residents and also a lot of students in this area. So high pedestrian um, activity. You can see the residents that requested this demonstration um, on the corner there taking photos um, and observing the um, kind of quick build, very temporary circle being um, constructed. And then also observing like what, what, what is was it what it is like when people are interacting with it on the street um on the left side someone navigating um with two people navigating with a bike and with a scooter and then on the right hand side you can see a car navigating successfully around the traffic circle a bus approaching um you'll see my colleague um with his back to us who is um measuring the speed of the bus as it um navigates around the circle and also um, some pedestrians crossing the street to a bus stop. Um, the outcome of this, it, we are in early days of this program and kind of our, uh, um, you know, spreading it more widely around the city, um, although it is available right now to anyone who might request it. But um, we've developed a kind of draft report template that we'll use to report back to the residents who requested the demonstration about how it went. Um, how much uh, the speed of traffic was reduced. Um, in this particular case, um, we actually ended up going with a larger traffic circle than even um, 12 foot at this intersection. Um, but you can see kind of the maximum speed decreasing um, as the from uh, no traffic circle to a 12 foot traffic circle. Um, and then uh, the average speed as well. So being able to kind of measure in real time what's happening with that demonstration and report it back to residents so that that can that data can kind of sit alongside their own ob observations of what um, what the impact was for traffic on the street. And then one uh, thing I wanted to mention quickly was the kind of impromptu engagement that happened um, via Facebook because of this particular demonstration. Someone in the neighborhood posted um, on their neighborhood Facebook page, about the demonstration in real time. And then we had just tons of people commenting um, with support, with questions, answering their neighbors' questions, defending the idea of traffic calming to their neighbors. Um, and yeah, it, this was really wonderful to see. And I, I think um, speaks to kind of the immediacy um, of the kind of engagement that we can receive when we uh, do something physical to test out a, to test out a measure. Um, so yeah, I'll stop there. And um, thank you so much for um, allowing me to share this program with you all. Um, if you'd like to get in touch with me, I'll post my um, email address in the chat as well. Great. Thank you, Danya. And um, everybody's slides and contact information will be made available to you all. Um, I really love the way that this really, this program really is community led, um, because really all of the problems that we're trying to solve in the way that the public space has been designed and especially the roadways is the result of professionals making the decisions without any community consultation or very, very little. And for this, you've really given uh, residents a lot of authority in deciding what happens on their streets, um, which is which is the the right philosophy in my view. Um, Jill Lokentor, uh, if you would uh, please tell us the story of the Denver Deserve Sidewalks campaign. Thank you, Ian, and thank you for inviting me to join you all today. I'm going to share my screen now.
All right. First, just a little background about the Denver Streets Partnership. We are a nonprofit advocacy group here in Denver focused on reducing our city's unsustainable dependence on cars um, and prioritizing people in the design of our communities. Our vision is that human dignity should be the guiding principle when we design our transportation system so that everybody can thrive and connect to where they need to go every day. One of the main issues we've been focused on literally since our founding is the sad state of sidewalks in Denver. I don't need to explain to you all why sidewalks are important for creating accessible and walkable communities. Denver is similar to a lot of cities around the country, particularly in the Western US, where the responsibility for building sidewalks and keeping them in a good state of repair traditionally had been entirely the responsibility of the adjacent private property owner, um, which is basically the equivalent of asking homeowners to fill the potholes and repave the street in front of your house. And surprise, that turns out to be a really terrible way to ensure the build out and maintenance of an effective network of transportation infrastructure. It truly is a citywide issue here in Denver. About 40% of our streets either have no sidewalk at all or a substandard sidewalk that's basically too skinny for a person in a wheelchair, a parent with a stroller, two people walking side by side. Um, you can see in this picture, there's an example of both conditions on one corner lot in Denver. Um, and it's also a social justice issue because missing and substandard sidewalks are particularly prevalent in our low income neighborhoods where people are most likely to depend on walking as a primary form of transportation um, and where we see the highest rate of pedestrian fatalities, partly due to the lack of safe pedestrian infrastructure. We've been talking about sidewalks in Denver for at least 20 years. Uh, Blueprint Denver is our integrated land use and transportation plan for the city. The first version of that plan came out in 2001 and pretty clearly stated that pedestrians are the primary form of transportation in our city and therefore it should be the primary element of our transportation infrastructure. The city developed its first pedestrian master plan in 2004, which called out the need for the city to take a more proactive role in maintaining the, the sidewalk network and pursue a funding system in order to make that possible rather than putting all the responsibility on the adjacent private property owner. Um, and the city itself actually proposed a model for funding sidewalks through a property fee back at this time. Uh, but fast forward 10 years later, still nothing was happening to follow up on these recommendations of the plans. These are a couple opinion and editorial pieces in our local newspaper talking about we should actually do something about sidewalks, not just talk about them, and they need to be a priority in our transportation system. So in 2015, uh, the predecessor to, to Denver Streets Partnership, which was Walk Denver, first launched our sidewalk campaign with a, a pretty simple ask. We wanted the city to take over responsibility for building and maintaining sidewalks, just like they build and maintain other basic infrastructure in the city, um, and to establish a dedicated funding source explicitly for this purpose. And we got a bunch of partner organizations to sign on. We put out a petition and collected nearly 3,000 signatures. And we did get some initial wins out of this campaign starting in the year 2017. We went from the city spending $0 on sidewalks per year to spending about an average of two to $3 million per year on new sidewalk construction. This was literally the first sidewalk that was poured uh, at once the city started spending that money. Uh, the city also passed a general obligation bond in 2017 that included nearly $50 million for new sidewalks in one of our lowest income neighborhoods. And the city actually started being proactive about inspecting the sidewalks um, and forcing the adjacent private property owner to repair them if that was what was needed. Um, but at the same time, the city was updating its pedestrian master plan and coming up with an estimate of what it would cost to actually build out the complete sidewalk network so that every neighborhood, every street in Denver has a sidewalk. Um, and at that time, the estimated cost was about a billion dollars of course, because of the pandemic and supply chain issues and all those things, the costs just keep going up. Um, but with the funding level that we were at of two to $3 million per year, that meant it was gonna take over 400 years to build out the complete sidewalk network. Uh, so at this point, 
but we got tired of waiting for our city leaders to take this issue seriously. Um, and in Colorado, we have the option of citizen initiated ballot measures, where if you can get enough signatures, you can petition to put something on the ballot for voters to approve. And we decided in 2022, that's what we were gonna do for sidewalks. Um, so we wrote the ordinance that we thought the city should pass, which removes the responsibility for repairs and construction of sidewalks from the adjacent private property owner and places it squarely on the city. It establishes funding for the construction and repairs of citywide sidewalks citywide through a property fee that's charged to every single property owner in Denver um, and generates enough revenue that we should be able to build out the sidewalk network within about a decade, as opposed to that 400 year timeline. And importantly, it does not sunset. It is a permanent dedicated funding source to provide ongoing repairs for sidewalks because we did not want to create a situation where we built the sidewalks and then immediately let them fall into disrepair, creating an unfunded need for future generations. We built a coalition um, and got more than 50 endorsements for the ballot measure, everything from individual neighborhood associations in Denver all the way up to national organizations like America Walks. Um, and then it took us about three years from that point to get it finally over the deadline. Uh, the first year was a, pretty much a mad scramble. It, we spent about four months writing the proposed ordinance um, and getting it approved by the city's election division so we could start collecting petition signatures. We had about three months to collect petition signatures. We needed about 11,000 to actually qualify for the ballot, but of course, not all signatures are valid. So we actually collected nearly double that, 20,000 signatures to get it on the ballot, which we qualified for in August. It went to the voters in November and passed, you know, for an initiative that's asking people to impose a fee on themselves, a 56% majority we felt was really pretty solid. Um, and then the next two years, we reverted back to the speed of government um, because even with citizen initiated ballot measures, uh, the city council does have the ability to amend those ordinances. It takes a, a super majority of the council um, and council did want to tinker with what we had written into the ordinance before they allowed the, the project to launch. And that took two full years of working with a stakeholder committee to make some amendments, uh, primarily focused on exactly how the fee is applied to specific properties throughout the city. City Council finally passed those amendments just this past September, and the, the project is scheduled to launch in January of 2025. The city will actually start collecting the fees, which will generate about $40 million per year. They will immediately use those funds to start doing critical sidewalk repairs and also simultaneously developing the master plan to build out the full network, um, which again is hopefully we'll be able to do that in about a decade rather than 400 years. So stay tuned. <laughs> There's still a lot to, to ensure the success of this program, but we are set for all systems go as of January of next year. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions in the chat. Great, thank you so much, Jill. What an inspiring story. And it'll be fascinating to watch how sidewalk conditions improve in Denver over the coming decade or so um, as, as this more systematic funding approach uh, um, and responsibility plays out. Um, something for Charlottesville to think about um, if, um, as I am assuming, uh, the current situation there is that private property owners are responsible. All right, we come to Axel Santana, who is going to give us an overview of, um, of, of the approach to transportation equity and mobility justice that really defines this whole webinar series. Um, because the individuals and groups and communities that have the greatest need in terms of safe uh, and accessible mobility, um, uh, we're not in no way responsible for having that need. It's clearly an ethical choice for us to prioritize the needs of those individuals, groups, and communities. That's what transportation equity and mobility justice are about. And Axel, please uh, tell us more. Yeah, thank you, Ian. Um, and thank you uh, for having us here. And thanks to my amazing um, fellow panelists. Uh, I feel like it's really inspiring to see all these great projects happening across the country. So really appreciate you all 
embodying um, transportation equity and mobility justice um, in your different communities. Um, as Ian mentioned, my name is Axel Santana. I'm an associate at PolicyLink and uh, chair of the Transportation Equity Caucus, um, calling in from California. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, PolicyLink is a national equity and action institute um, focused on advancing racial equity um, and economic prosperity for um, people across the country. Uh, we are based out of Oakland, California, and we have a variety of different um, subjects that we work on, including housing, climate, um, water, equity, and um, infrastructure and transportation. As part of our transportation equity work, um, which I lead, uh, we convene a group called the Transportation Equity Caucus, um, which is a national network of organizations working on um, transportation, climate, uh, public health, and different issues in the intersections um, of equity um, in different parts of the country, of which America Walks is a member of. Um, so excited to be here with you all having this conversation. Um, so some of the uh, inequities and root causes that we're hoping to address through our work um, and that we hope you know others also um, will have joined us and will join us um, is really thinking about how transportation dollars are spent using car-centric and um, freeway-centric state funding models and don't center frontline community needs uh, for the most part. And then also how federal resources and programs that are tied to infrastructure um, uh, are not implemented and distributed equitably to the most impacted communities. So I think um, you know the presentations before me uh, did a great job of showing how um, folks can really involve the communities that are most impacted in the planning and design process of um, any programs or projects that you're hoping to advance. Um, and so I know you all got a little bit of a taste of mobility justice in the last few um, webinars, um, so I won't get too deep into the principles or um, information around that, but just wanted to, to share that mobility justice is really thinking about how folks can move freely and safely in their communities. Um, and oftentimes um, the most marginalized groups, whether that's low income communities, communities of color, um, disabled folks, um, are really uh, bearing the brunt of, of those impacts within their communities. Um, and oftentimes you all see when folks are trying to cross the street, um, it ends up being jaywalking or, or some other form that's not always legalized um, in different parts of the country. And often those uh, folks end up getting over-policed because the, they're, the, there's a police presence um, in those communities. And so mobility justice thinks about how do we repair those harms and make sure that um, folks can move freely and safely across their community, whether it's focusing on the infrastructure um, and the built environment, but also um, what are the other sort of safety alternatives um, than over-policing um, in, those, in those communities. And so, Thinking about um, uh, mobility justice principles and putting them into practice, um, uh, the Untokening came up with a great set of uh, principles that you know we don't have time to get into today. But um, here are some that I thought are sort of um, some of the higher level important ones to consider, um, and that's really seeking to repair harm and not erase history, while also valuing community voices as essential data and cultivating. Um, collective cross sector and community power. And the way that you know you, we can see that um, being put into practice is by leveraging data to identify who has been the most harmed by previous policies and decisions um, while listening to and meaningfully engaging community in planning and decision-making, um, which I think my, my presenter colleagues did a great job in their uh, various projects of doing that. Um, while also inter ensuring intersectional and accessible approaches to community empowerment. Um, oftentimes we get siloed and folks have um, different conversations with different demographics, um, but I think it's important to, to bring folks together in the mix um, who are experiencing different intersectional identities. Um, and so some quick examples of what this looks like includes um, participatory budgeting, uh, culturally relevant engagement and programming, um, putting together community advisory committees that are made up of residents of the communities um, who can share and, and help guide um, the process, and then bringing diverse groups together um, when engaging communities, as I mentioned, um, intersectional groups, um, not just different ethnicities and, and uh, backgrounds, but also um, uh, different uh, levels of ability and um, 
uh, you know, sexual identities and, and that sort of thing. Um, and then, of course, including anti-displacement strategies in your work um, to make sure that the benefits that are being brought into the community um, aren't pushing those same groups that are, um, you know, pushing for that, for those changes um, and pushing them out. And so one thing I, I like to, we at Policy Link and, and the Transportation Equity Caucus like to um, remind folks is um, uh, the importance of using data to tell a story. So I think, um, again, my, my presenter colleagues did a great job of um, using data to help make the case for why, you know, sidewalks are important or these different um, sort of traffic calming uh, um, platforms are, are relevant. And so what does the community want? What are they asking for? Um, and how can you also leverage their personal stories um, to supplement the data? And so um, one resource I want to share with you all is, if you haven't heard about it, is the National Equity Atlas, which is a partnership between PolicyLink and our um, colleagues at USC, uh, University of Southern California. Um, and I think the this is a great platform that has a lot of great indicators and data um, from different uh, metros across the country. Um, and I think it's a great resource for folks um, to think about uh, racial equity and how to advance shared prosperity through data. Um, and then like a sort of side sister project of that is the Bay Area Equity Atlas, which is obviously it's focused on the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, but they, I think, just do a great job of um, featuring stories from different community members across uh, the different counties um, and sharing their stories of, of how how the data actually comes to life um, and impacts a person on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so I'll share those links with you all after I'm done presenting. Um, and obviously the Bay Area is specific to the Bay, but if there's some sort of resource or um, uh, interest in, in doing something like that in, in Charlottesville, I think that would be really um, helpful um, for your work. Um, and then in terms of planning, um, I think, you know, as you get into your action planning, uh, I just wanted to share a few sort of questions that help, um, you know, in, in our spaces of planning and thinking about when we're, we're, we're doing strategic thinking. Um, and so that includes, you know, what are some of the major shifts, reforms, and outcomes that you'd like to see in um, your transportation policy practice and spending over the next five to 10 years and then work backwards from there once you've set those goals, right? So that helps you um, define and create a straight line um, there. Um, one of the questions that, you know, we ask as equity practitioners always is who benefits and who pays and who is in the room um, when decisions are being made. And so, you know, as you're doing your action planning, making sure that there's processes set up um, for, for folks to be able to um, engage in a meaningful way. And then of course, you know, who are the key um, existing or potential allies and partners that you'll need to um, engage in order to move this vision forward? Um, as you all know, I'm sure we can't do this work alone. So um, how do we make sure we uh, bring along the coalitions and networks the important partners um, that can really help us um, move this work along and get to the, the outcomes we hope to see. And so I'll just close um, by saying that um, I think it's really important in the your action plans and any sort of strategic documents that you, you put together is to really call out explicit commitments um, around um, either equity, mobility, justice, however you wanna frame it within your community um, to make sure that there are measurable outcomes that you can actually measure against and make sure that you're um, advancing um, and making sure that the, those commitments are explicit so that not only are you holding yourselves accountable, but the community and the folks that you're hoping to benefit and impact can also follow up and say, hey, you committed to this, like, where are we on that? Um, and I think that creates a really um, a meaningful loop between community and, and planners and, and departments. So. Um, I'll just end with that and pass it back to Ian. Happy to answer any questions in the chat. Thanks so much, Axel. And really underscoring that making an explicit commitment and repeating that explicit commitment to transportation equity throughout the <clears throat> both development and implementation process of this action plan is, is really important because one thing I've learned is that the existing systems and structures and culture um, will tend to channel resources 
to the areas that already have resources and ignore the the places and the people that don't. So it really has to be an intentional statement, an explicit commitment to that equity approach. And, and every decision has to be measured against that. Okay, it's time for uh, the uh, small group discussions. And, and um, Peter and Peter, we had you originally as doing two separate rooms based on the number of participants uh, in the webinar as a whole. We're going to combine you two so you can share facilitation. Um, but uh, Rachel, if you want to go ahead and assign people to their rooms, uh, one room will be led by Peter Krebs and Peter Thompson, one by Chris Miller, one by Sue Friedman, and one by Garrett Brumfield. How long? What's the time? Oh. Let's do eight minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. And the question. Yes, we're going to do three separate <laughs> sessions. The first question is describe your vision for equity in pedestrian infrastructure in Charlottesville and Albemarle County. And we'll do eight minutes on that one question. And then we'll have a two minute uh, report out and then go back for the second question. Okay. Good. All right, have a Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else have something they would like to share in terms of their visions? Lucinda, I see you. Would you like to, to share? Um, I I always feel so radical. Um, so I, I just think that uh, it should be as easy and safe to walk as it is to drive on our infrastructure. That's my vision. I love it. I love it. I love it. I always th think that too, you know, using a mobility scooter is at times so unsafe, you know, for, for me and for others with disabilities or people that are lower to the ground, you know, children walking about. So yeah, it's challenging. And I'm personally finding even more challenges. Just I, I moved just a couple of blocks from where I lived before and just the difference of how fast traffic moves and you know how they don't pay attention to pedestrians near as much i'm, I'm near a, a more major road you know it is a, it is a challenge anyway um would anyone else like to uh to share to go next gabriel oh i know you you're in here too hey bud hey <laughs> um yeah you know i um I feel like I'm like pretty new to this conversation in terms of infrastructure and, and transportation, but um, you know, the, the walk on, it was like a really, um, you know, great experience for me. Um, you know, I would just sort of want people to genuinely believe that it makes sense for them to walk and bike and, um, you know, use uh, walkways to get to various places um, uh, with ease, like sort of trust that the, the infrastructure and the ability is there. Um, I think that there's like a lot of, apprehension and like rightfully so like you know even sometimes i'm i'm like walking in like the residential areas around town and like you know i could like almost slip or like you know there are some like pretty steep um you know walkways so i would just sort of want people to like trust that like you know if they want to like if the weather is nice they they could easily get to where they need to go with ease absolutely yeah safety Feeling safe is just as important as, as actually being safe. And, you know, and, and the feeling of safety, especially for those who have had certain challenges or, or experience, you know, unsafe environments can, can really take a while to get people tuned back into that feeling of safety. And then last up, sorry, I, what, what is your first name? Uh, Yep, I'm Jessica. Um, I'm happy to add a few thoughts. I was really inspired by today's presentations. I really liked, especially hearing from Denver and Milwaukee, um, folks being able to, to to look to the local expertise of residents. I really like that as part of the conversation of transportation planning. Um, I also like, I don't know that it was covered as much today as much as in previous um, uh panel discussions for this this webinar series, but I really like expanding our definition of equity. Um, I think that sometimes we can get like caught up in like under like historically underserved communities and and I think that equity looks even broader than that. I love thinking about um, 
like different ages, like how is, how are older folks getting around? How are younger folks getting around? Like both of those groups should have freedom and autonomy to move and like experience the world and we should make it safe for all everyone to do that. I agree. Ian, do you have anything you'd like to add on this, uh, this first question? You're on mute. <laughs> How's that? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, I was just going to sort of share a resource that just popped into my head as uh, as you were speaking, Jessica, um, and that is the curb cut effect. Are folks familiar with that uh, that ar article or doc document um, by Angela Glover Blackwell? Uh, it, it tells the story of, of curb cuts becoming a thing and the way that they provide, although they were originally designed for a very specific subset of people, how it has turned out that they improve conditions for everybody. And that is a is a true outcome of, um, you know, so many um, uh, interventions that are uh, followed for a, you know, to pursue an equity approach. It turns out that if you design your program or your places or your, you know, environment for the people that have the greatest challenges and barriers to overcome, then you create a great place for everybody. Kind of a universal design thing. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, indeed. Well, thank you guys for sharing. Now, Ian, we are going to go back into the main room and then we're going to keep the same breakout participants. Yes, it'll be the same group. So, well, we're okay. actually going to pull two rooms together because they were relatively low on numbers, but this group will stay the same. So let's all okay. uh, jump back to the main room. We'll have a quick report out and then we'll go to the second question. Great. Thank you all. for our community. I'll um, repeat my vision as a goal, um, which is that all, uh, all streets are equally safe and um, easily accessible for pedestrians as vehicles. Yeah, I like the emphasis on safety that you mentioned and someone else did that did not come up in our group. And it was one of the next things I was gonna bring up until we ran out of time, particularly in light of recent community happenings. What other goals? Thank you, Lou. What about the idea that, that Sue, I think, addressed a little bit of, of trying to have some type of integrated plan? You know, we've got a transportation plan, a bike bed plan, a state bike bed plan. There's, you know, Charlottesville and Almarle are renowned for creating plans, and I don't mean to make poke fun at that, while well, some people do. <clears throat> um, and, and I think a lot of those groups are mandated to do their own planning, so we can't have a single planning process what about the, would a goal be trying to somehow have an integrated plan around all users who use our streets and roads? We we have a ped bike plan. But I'm talking about an integrated plan that's a bike ped plan and the cat plan and John's plan and what's in city or county comp plans. I mean, there's a lot of different plans. Is, is there an integrated plan that would meet your the vision as you spelled it out, Lucinda. Gosh, I don't know like how somebody would do that. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, I think Peter, that's probably the goal of the long range transportation plan that the MPOs are required to put together. Um, you know, whether it was successful or not, I think that's a different um, discussion, but that, that could be a good um, place for that kind of integrated planning to occur because it's regional in nature, but should also address multimodal. That said, um, 
there are some different considerations in terms of transit because that focuses a lot of on operations versus infrastructure, but that could be an opportunity to do some of that that you're talking about. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be said for trying to, you know, if there is an existing tool that is supposed to be that, but if it, that, am I right? That's the plan that comes through the planning district, that long range. Okay. Yeah. So the one that I've, I've attended some of the community input around those, et cetera, and what Keith CTAC works on and. Okay. Uh, we, we can always update that plan too right sand yeah we can always update the plan we'd have to like citizens or or the counties would have to make a request to the mpo to put that in our in our work plan for staff to work on in the coming years um i was thinking like uh a lot of times for equity organizations will say like you know if if their product or whatever it is like if our plans like we have to answer like five questions if they meet our goals or not. And one of them could be, you know, is it pedestrian accessible? Is it appropriate for pedestrians? If so, you know, um, is it safe or equally safe for pedestrians versus drivers? Like that could be a question that's mandatory for all plans or something like that. Yeah, I, I like that because with, with all all due respect, um, you know, a lot of the plans I see are very car centric um, and, and don't necessarily. I mean, I remember how mind boggling it was to me to hear that, you know, intersections that are graded A through F in the Commonwealth can get an A grade and be literally impossible for a pedestrian to walk across because it's based entirely on cars, correct? Yeah. But that yeah. <clears throat> maybe some, Maybe that would be a that would be a goal to me to change the frickin' grading process. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, that's outside of our purview. But for you know every resident in of the um, urban area to have multiple practical transportation options. That's a good one. Yeah. So I have a question that's might be a little off topic, but um, whatever happened to complete streets? Like, I know that there was a movement many, many years ago um, and Virginia signed on to have complete streets, which meant that they would have like ped bike facilities equal, I think, equal to vehicles. Um, but it doesn't seem like we're implementing that anymore. I don't know. Yeah, there is. The state has adopted a complete streets policy, so it is adopted into it. it, it it's based on um, context. That there are some context that goes into it, but that is a statewide policy. So, is the question maybe how well are we following that locally? I know the CAA Transportation Work Group a couple of years ago we were talking about that, and and our city and county reps could not identify an example of a complete street in our greater Charlottesville Elmore community a couple of years ago, or, or, or a clear plan on how we were moving in that direction is my recollection. And again, I don't mean by any means to be mean spirit, and I'm just talking about what I hear of the reality of our situation. Hey, Sandy, if you have like the context or any information on that, can you just send it to me? Yes, but it's not going to be all inclusive because there are exceptions to exceptions and design waivers and stuff but yeah i can send you a document thanks we're gonna run out of time i think in about a minute other goals to achieve the tentative vision at least as we talked about it today i mean maybe if we um like we don't have to recreate the wheel and we can just go back to the complete streets goals certainly worth looking at. We have several city and county employees here. Anything you have to add as far as in that direction of what might already be happening or amendments or thoughts on those goals? Um, 
Uh, ben, ben mentioned elevating the missing modes in, in our planning process, so focusing. The move safely Blue Ridge. Albera, help me. What, what is that? The um... It's essentially, um, it's part of the federal funding, but it's looking at improving safety for mainly drivers in the TJPDC region. So that's Albemarle, Charlottesville, Louisa, Nelson, uh, Fluvanna counties. That's that's more focused on driving and certain intersections and segments of road that have a um, high number of crashes and fatalities. That's a little different than the walking stuff, but it still incorporates thinking about pedestrian fatalities and pedestrian crashes that do happen from uh, drivers as well. So I have a weird question, maybe not. Can we get where we want to go where all those things you've talked about all this time, Tommy, um, specifically looking at bicycle and pedestrian walkability friendly, or do, will it be wise to say, this is how we make it safe for drivers? We're going to have more walkability, more bikes, more pedestrians, and that makes it safe for driving too. I mean, what what's going to um, work? Do you think specifically yeah. looking at bicycle pedestrian alone is going to work or somehow figuring out how we move into the move safely in Blue Ridge space and co-op that? Well, yeah, I think just um, I think that the way I look at the move safely Blue Ridge is a little different than perhaps the county or the counties that surround us, like Louisa and Fluvanna, which are part of the region, uh, because all the stuff that we, we've been working on definitely highlights bike and pedestrian infrastructure needs, less so car infrastructure. But that's because we're the only urban environment. That all being said, it's not like Alberic also isn't having those conversations about the urban ring around Charlottesville. I'm just saying that like our focus is geared towards like bike ped infrastructure with that with that um, project. I guess I don't love the language of saying we're going to improve s stuff for car drivers in general, yeah. whatever that may be, <laughs> um, even if so, it's true. So what would like if 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 we could enhance bike pack in some way? What would it be? Would it be around engagement? Would it be around a specific project? Would it be around pushing for the transportation plan through the regional transportation authority? Maybe I can I can try to answer this. Um, to answer the previous question about making things safer for biking or for walking or for driving, that's the kind of the essence of what multimodal planning is. Um, it's incorporating all modes of transport and realizing that all modes are legitimate and that they're all important. And that, yes, people have to drive sometimes. You have delivery trucks, you have vans doing whatever. You have to have drivers. That's that's a thing you need to have. Um, and I think for next steps, it's it's super different for county and city just because we have VDOT to go through and the city does not, and they actually control the roads. So that the actual steps we would take would be different. I think for the county, our first step would be literally just going to VDOT and being like, hey, our traffic coming process that we have right now isn't working because we're not doing any actual traffic coming. We get a lot of complaints, but nothing actually happens. <clears throat> Can we try something that allows us more flexibility? Um, and I think this, and then, so a transportation plan, we've talked about it in staff internally, but that's, that's years out after the comp plan, after we get through stuff. Because again, we don't, we don't know how we're going to start tackling these problems because we don't have the uh, agency to be able to do it how we would like if that makes sense. So I, I will I will say, Alberic, I agree with all that. Um, I will say um, that this the county does have opportunities to build like more resources um, that they haven't put funding towards yet, right? Like the Old Mills Greenway Extension, the Northtown Greenway Extension. These are projects that like exist in theory but there's no funding put towards them. That could be a major um, win. That That's outside of VDOT. That's why I'm saying that. Um, but uh, we do our own, our own roads. And we also have, 
Yeah, I'm trying to. Um, I agree with the whole multimodal like concept and like goals of that. I just don't know if that's like the the most if that's the goal that we should try to prioritize right now. Um, or there's more if there's something more acute, more something that we can try to tackle sooner. Uh, you're muted, Sue. Yeah. If you could pick one action goal for the city, what would you pick? Uh, to install all the sidewalks that we have on our sidewalk priority list. Okay. And to install them so that they're user-friendly for everybody. Well, I mean, they're not going to be in the city. You can't technically bike on them. So they would be user-friendly in terms of ADA compliant. Um, right. and, 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 our, and the goal would be that they, they're great facilities to use. Right. Um, but uh, so what not, keeps us from doing that? Is it money? No, I mean, that's right now, that's going to be the thing that keeps us from doing it. Cause there's technically, there is some money set aside to, to tackle the couple that we have like in our next up. But, um, what, what I've learned now being in this role for over a year is that there really honestly wasn't a great um, process in, built into the staffing to actually get these projects accomplished. And that's what we've been working on for the past 12 months is like building that infrastructure internally to actually like get projects done. But I will say to Ellen's point, it's really helpful for me when the, when like the community is calling for these projects. So like going back to the engagement, like it, it kind of, it's a circle, it's a, it's a loop. Um, you know, sometimes I'll ask people to send me that in the email so then I can forward that to other people and, you know, keep everyone accountable and so forth. Are you doing like the encouragement, like walk to, you know, bike to work weeks and walk to school days? Those are helpful. We we did, um, we did a bunch of that. We, we turned a whole bike week into bike month. Um, and we're actually setting up a, a website called Bike Walk Seville. Um, that's going to be helpful. And I do neighborhood walks once a month. Cool. That helps. Yeah. Great. Well, I heard some really uh, engaged action planning happening in the room that I was in. Uh, I'm sure it was the same in the other room. We're basically <clears throat> at the end of our time. So I want to just wrap up by thanking everybody for staying with the process till the end. And I'm going to hand over to Chris and Sue to talk about next steps in Charlottesville and Albemarle County. Okay, Chris and I as co-chairs are very appreciative of those who put this together. Thank you, Ian and Garrett for being main leaders and all the people, the many people, over a hundred different people who participated in the webinars. <clears throat> And in terms of next steps, especially for the transportation work group, we're going to ask the transportation work group chair, Peter Thompson, to give us a kind of a guide on what's next for us. Thank you, Sue and Chris, and thank you, Ian. I also want to thank AARP Virginia that um, did this technical assistance pro bono grant <clears throat> that through then CAA brought Ian and all these great panelists to our community to share their expertise and to facilitate the conversations. Um, CAA is a group of over 20 some organizations that is committed to being um, age friendly as defined by AARP and the World Health Organization. And two of the big dimensions of that are transportation and the built environment. Um, so those are big focus areas for us. Uh, we plan to continue to work uh, with others. There's many other organizations out in the community and alliances and work through our many partners, which includes the city of Charlottesville and Albemarle County and the TJPDC um, to move this agenda forward. Um, we are a small organization with no budget and no staff, but we do have uh, great resources, again, through our membership um, and look forward to working with many of you and others who have been here throughout the last month to try to move this agenda forward. So thank you, Ian. Thank you, everybody, for your participation. Yes. And, and I, I forgot to mention it, but just to be clear, um, all of the uh, 
feedback, the ideas that have been collected from these breakout rooms, uh, as well as from the workshop back in June, uh, Garrett and I will be going through that and we will be developing your uh, first draft of your action plan based on what we've heard. That'll be our final deliverable and then it'll be for you to take that and run with it. Great, great. And uh, just as a PS, we have a conversation scheduled early next month with Timothy and AARP about the consultants and the projects we might pursue in 2025. So really looking forward to the transportation work group to to uh, you know inform where we where we need to go next. Thank you, Ian. Great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Bye, guys. Have a good one.